Well, hello everyone and welcome to the EPA's Pay360 Lending in the Digital Age session. I'm Chris Corbett, I work for Visa and I am uh, one of the directors for our consumer solutions in our UK and Ireland product team. I'm here with two of our great partners, Capital on Tap and Time It, so I'll hand over to Roku to introduce himself. Hello everybody, thanks for, uh, for listening in. I am Robastiano Tubio, or Roku for short, uh, like a, that's my high school nickname. So, and I'm Chief Financial Officer at Timeit, and um, I'm here to deliver a nice presentation about our launch uh, products. Cool. And uh, I'm Damien Brightje. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Capital on Tap, and we specialize in credit cards for small businesses. Fantastic. So. What I'm going to do, I'll give us a quick introduction into what Visa is seeing as changing sort of in the lending and financial services arena at the moment. And then I'll hand over to Roku and Damien who'll give us an introduction. So lending really finds itself at the intersection of, of change at the moment. And this was certainly applicable before the pandemic as well. So for consumers, their expectations are, are really set by all of the different digital solutions that they they use today no longer is it the benchmark across your financial services or your, your bank relationships that you have you now compare versus your other the tech giants that you have and the relationships you you have with those those tech giants with covid as well we've seen the acceleration of the need to adopt and adapt to new changes from a provider perspective Consumers expect simple and easy access to, to all their services and now need a sort of a full digital account management capability. Whereas before we've seen particularly um, with some traditional providers, more of a um, more of a solution, which is part digital rather than full digital. So we're certainly seeing that move. Technology as well is really driving this. So now we have the capabilities in order to offer these to consumers and that's what they expect. Things like AI, 5G, blockchain have long been talked about in industry buzzwords, really, but we're starting to see them being embraced, which is again driving towards the types of consumer solutions we want to see. And then in Europe, we have the regulation. And regulators have been really progressive here and, and are really trying to drive innovation themselves as well. We see open banking as obviously a huge, a huge event here and a, and a huge piece of regulation, which has helped to drive to never before seen visibility and control of data from a consumer perspective, enable them to get a 360 view of their own financial lives. It's, it's really key and for lending, this is particularly important for consumers and SMEs. So whether you're a thin file customer or an SME um, looking to get working capital, leveraging these new forms of data and your own data um, in order to get access to the credit that you need is really beneficial for, for everyone. So we've seen a rapid adoption of new credit models across different markets and across the globe. So starting with what we've seen with the buy now, pay later and flexible forms of, of microcredit, Afterpay have been hugely successful over there. And now we're seeing the same sort of disruption happening in the UK with the likes of Klarna, Clearpay, Afterpay, Brandier, and several other providers entering the space as well. We also see more structured forms of repayments prevalent elsewhere in the world. And these are very mature markets as well. So we take markets like Brazil, Mexico, Turkey, Greece, Israel, to name a few. But here installments, as a sort of equal monthly installments are really commonplace and completely embedded into how people pay and is the normal for them. So as an example of this in Brazil, over 50% of their credit card payments are actually on installments. So it's a really thriving thriving area. In terms of what's driving this as well, we really see that consumers are adopting alternative ways to access credit and there's a greater alignment between the provision and the usage of credit. So this isn't limited to point of sale finance, it's certainly a trend that we've seen um, previously. For example, from the motor finance industry, new car sales now, of, of those new cars that are sold, 91% are actually uh, made through a financing agreement. And that's where we've got the car as the good that the consumer is um, looking to take out. They have a need and that, that's the direct need. And therefore they look for credit or funds in order, to, in order to facilitate that need. So if we think about that from a, how that's disrupting the consumer journey in a traditional customer life cycle, 
Traditionally, a customer would have come through, had their first banking product, they've got their first Visa card, so their first transactional account, they're able to start spending. They then may have had their first phone contract, that would be their first dip into credit, if you like, or a student overdraft, for example. And then as they uh, get older, they may have got their first credit card from that same bank that they got the overdraft. They may have then taken out a personal loan or, or a loan for a small business and then eventually into the mortgage as well. And this sort of life cycle was very traditional and has been in place for, for many years. However, what we've seen is a fragmentation of this and an unbundling of banking services as well. So we mentioned buy now, pay later and installments. We have alternative lenders and particularly in the SME space, we've seen lots of great new uh, value propositions for SMEs, the motor finance piece, and even alternative mortgage brokers as well uh, starting to enter the space. And all of this is being precipitated by firstly the growth and expansion of the existing fintechs and the fintech scene more broadly in, in the UK is obviously thriving uh, and that's leading to these new service providers. We've also got open banking as we talked about with new underwriting data, new account aggregation models and new distribution models being um, coming to the fore and then no doubt there'll be more and more alternative lenders uh, as well coming to the market and looking to leverage and feedback off the success that we've seen from other providers. So with that I'd like to hand over to our partner uh, Roku who's going to give us an overview of the, the time of business. All right, thanks so much uh, Chris for having me and uh, I have a little a few slides to share with the audience. So we set out three years ago now, uh, although we've only launched in this uh, last December, just over uh, six, seven months ago, we've been at it for, for a good three years. We, we set out to reinvent the way the credit cards work. There, there has been a lot of innovation uh, in checking accounts and otherwise financial services, uh, but very little innovation in, in the credit card space ever since they were launched in 1950s. So we thought that we could do a lot better here. Um, for our 33 million customers or credit card holders in, in the UK uh, that actually think that a credit card is very good to spending. We're, it's ingrained in our, in our, in our psyche. Uh, we use them every day to spend on them. They're great for spending because they have purchase protections they have uh, an interest fee period and they have uh, several have several of them have cash rewards and, and other kind of rewards and but only a third of them 12 million customers use the credit cards for for borrowing which is quite you know rather surprising as they called credit cards you know one would, would think that uh, you'd get go get a credit card because you want credit uh, well, we just find that only a third of them uh, does revolve on the, on the balance, which means they pay just the minimum at month end and look to push back the, the balance out. So we've gone out and done a lot of research uh, about traditional credit cards and seeking to find the, the main pain points. And what we find, found is particularly focus on borrow, focusing on borrowing on credit cards, we found that people don't like them because they don't know the cost of financing uh, when they're making the purchase. They'll only know how much they're paying in interest once the statement arrives a month later at their home address or, or, or over email, which turns out to be uh, all in all very, experience, very expensive in general uh, because that lack of clarity doesn't allow me to plan ahead and know exactly how much uh, I'm going to have to pay next month equally, uh, which means that I may have to push it again into the next month, paying the minimum and uh, entering into a cycle, a virtuous cycle that, that leads to um, persistent debt. Persistent debt is something that has been trending a lot in the UK very recently because the FCA um, don't like this at all, is 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 whereby a person ends up paying interest over interest uh, because they're in a stuck with a debt that they cannot pay pay off. So we think that credit cards, uh, or at least the, the product we, we bring to, to the public, has a clear way out of, of debt and a clear way uh, to pay off your balance. 
in full. So the way we achieve this is, uh, is by offering installments. The installments will be made up of equal monthly install payments that are made up of interest and principal, making sure that by the end of the plan that you've chosen, you'll, you'll completely uh, paid off your, your principal, which, which is what interest is it's paid off over. So with that, we, we believe that this provides uh, transparency you know, seeing your costs up front gives you transparency that leads uh, to a situation for you to control your spending better uh, and your financing decisions better. We like to think that the financing was typically done after you bought the, the item, you go buy, buy an item and then decide to pay the minimum on your card, so you're pushing out your 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 purchase amount, uh, but we now like to think that we bring those two decisions, which are very linked to each other, to the to the point of purchase or the moment of, of purchase, which all in all adds adds up to greater financial wellness, which is uh, I guess one of the wellness we're all after. Um, and uh, the difficulty with uh, creating an installment platform if you don't have a, a means of spreading it out wide quite quickly is is the technical integration that the buy now pay later uh, installment of offerings require uh, so if you think about it Klarna or the likes have to go to each merchant to offer their, their solution and and go into a project to involve engineers and, and integrate the 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 technology. However, if we're able to tap onto Visa's network, into Visa scheme, we're already there where Visa is accepted. And we we have partnered up a, a Visa credit card, which is widely accepted all over the world. Even if I travel to Thailand, uh, most shops will accept uh, Visa. Uh, a a state-of-the-art installment platform that we've created from the ground up and the mobile experience, it, it is up to, to standards with any other mobile experience with uh, spending categorization, ability to bundle up uh, purchases, and uh, the offering of being able to decide how, how, in how many installments you want to pay your, um, your credit card. And we've combined all those three things. And the result is a credit card that is a new time kind of credit card, a credit card reinvented. That in terms allows you to spread your purchases into up to 24 months. Uh, it may well be 6, 12, 24, but equally you can do three months at interest free. So any purchase that you buy on time it and, and you pay neither one or three months is going to be uh, free, free interest. We also charge no international fees or no, no markups, for example, that other, other cards tend to, tend to charge. Real-time notifications, like any other uh, neo bank uh, these days, and uh, ultimately, we're the first issuer of instantaneous credit lines. So, if you download the the Time app on the App Store and you and you apply for a credit card, it may take you the application form may take you between two and three minutes, it, provided you pass the credit scoring and the KYC, you may get a virtual card there and there on your phone that is enable for you to go and spend right there on the spot. The physical card would arrive in your in your in your home address a few days later, obviously. But I just wanted to show you I've got a few a few demos that I wanted to show you how the app works. So you go and tap your card on onto merchant of choice, you tap on the notification which opens up a purchase plan like this and you'll be able to select the number of installments you you want to make, and we'll show you not only the APR uh, as an interest rate, but also the amount of interest that you'll be paying on a monthly basis. So that purchase there, the Hilton Hotels purchase, no longer shows as a 980 pound purchase, but now it shows like six installments of 168. Secondly, you're also able to look at your cash flow statement on a much neater, transparent way. 
So that same purchase I'm going to now pay uh, or plan in 12, 12 months. And you're going to see how my cash flow statement changes, which gives you, I suppose, clarity from a, from a, from a payback perspective. You know what you're going to be paying back every month which uh, we've surveyed this long enough, uh, it, it makes our customers feel smarter. And finally, the last, uh, I've got two more demos to show you. Uh, if I, we have a simulator, not only we can, uh, you can plan a purchase once you've done the purchase, but also ahead of making that purchase, you can simulate a purchase on the, on the app and you can see how your cash flow statement changes um, going forward, which gives you, I suppose, tranquility or, or, or comfort that you'll be able to afford those monthly repayments. And last but not least, uh, a feature that we like a lot, which is the bundling ability to bundle your purchases. If I go on a, on a trip and I buy my flights and my hotels or my timing card, I'll be able to bundle those in a, in a same item and then just drop in any other Ubers or dinners spend or any any other things that I think make relevant is relevant to, to finance together and I'm able to choose the desired plan for the holiday package as a whole. So that's pretty much it from me really. I the only other thing is to reiterate, I know I've said it before, but just to make it clear we have no fees of any kind, no maintenance fee, no FX fee, no markup as you can see so um so this is what we what we set off to achieve um three pretty much three years ago and uh we're really glad to be available on app store and on google play so please give it a try and and, and let us know what you think thanks so much for listening i'm going to hand over now to uh damien from capital and south Thanks, Roku. Um, my name is Damien. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Capital on Tap, and uh, you know, thanks to the EPA for uh, hosting this and for everyone watching. Um, Capital on Tap is um, focused on providing credit cards to small businesses uh, here in the UK, and we've just actually launched in Spain. So I wanted to talk kind of about um, our journey and our product and, and how we got here. So we started Capital on Tap eight years ago in 2012, with the goal of making getting business funding simple, fast, and easy. Um, we identified this big gap in the market where banks were withdrawing uh, kind of funding lines to small businesses. And we saw that there was kind of no market for kind of credit cards for businesses in the UK. And so we said, well, you know, these are really useful tools. And if you can build a really great product for small businesses, surely there's, there, there's gonna be some demand and well, We'll see how hard that journey was uh, in a second, but it, the answer is there was demand once you got the product right. And we find that this, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic that's happening now, that even more banks and alternative lenders are gonna withdraw funding for small businesses once the government support ends. And, and we've lent over 250 million pounds since lockdown started in March to small businesses. And we believe that there is, still you know the need and the demand to help small businesses through this crisis and so we're actually really proud of what we've done and what our teams achieved so um, we think this this kind of why now is now more than ever small businesses need really good tools for both payments and for lending services and if, if we think about you know the problem we're trying to solve is working capital for the small business and we kind of boiled it down to there's three central tenants that we wanted to, to, to that we thought would always be true, you know, it didn't matter what the product was, where we were in the cycle and, you know, everything like that. And that was speed, simplicity, and service. And so we wanted to make a simple credit product that's simple decisions, really fast, and that our customers would get the best service any time of day. And, and those were kind of the, 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 the tenets of what we tried to set out to do because the, the state even kind of for where it was in 2012 and, and where, where lending to businesses is today is kind of still very traditional in the sense that if you want to get a credit card from your bank, oftentimes you have to go into the branch or they'll ask for your uh, cash flow projections. You know, you might've been a customer of theirs for 10 years and they'll still ask you, hey, can you send, you know, your three years of cash, you know, cash flow projections and financial statements um, and come into the branch and talk to your account manager 
Um, and we just thought, you know, given where payments and lending is going and the digitization of, of the whole process, we just thought that was crazy and, and we thought there was a better way. Uh, and it turns out there is. Um, and so our product is a super simple revolving credit agreement for small businesses with a credit card provided by Visa on top. And the way it works is if you're a small business and let's say you Google business funding, business working capital, um, or business credit card, you'll, you know, we'll probably be bidding on that. And if you click on it and it says, you know, here's the product, you, you fill in your business details. It's about 90 seconds. And 10 seconds later, we'll give you a credit decision. We'll say yes or no. And then we'll also provide you with an interest rate and a credit limit. You know, on average, our credit limits are uh, initial credit limits are, are 10,000 pounds, which, you know, we see a lot of businesses that can't get business credit cards go down the personal credit card route. And that is great, but the average credit limit is built for consumers. So their average credit limit initially is 500 or 700 pounds. So we provide these small businesses with a suitable credit limit and, and their card arrives two business days later and they have access to the entire credit limit to send uh, as cash into their business bank account. And what I described isn't revolutionary, but it kind of is in the business lending space uh, in the UK and in Spain where we're operating now, because it's still so traditional and archaic where you can't just get simple answers and quick answers. And, and on top of the speed and simplicity we've built, we've also, um, we've also tried to add kind of the best service we could imagine. And what that means is we now operate 24 seven, 365, and the average call pickup time is under 30 seconds. So if you call at 10 p.m. because your card didn't work for whatever reason, or you lost your card, someone will answer your call within 30 seconds most of the time. And it's actually confusing to customers because when they ring the number on the back of the card and someone goes, hi, you're through to Damien at Capital on Tap. How can I help you today? They're not used to being able to call their credit providers and get that level of service. So I think between the speed, simplicity, and service, we've really kind of created the that product we've always wanted to have. And then on top of that, we've built this product just for small businesses. So, you know, there's, you know, there's concept of bundling and unbundling. So right now the, 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 a bank would be bundled, right? A bank offers 40 products to every, every customer segment. So if you're a consumer, there's your bank will sell you 40 products. If you're a business bank, will sell you 40 products. If you're a corporate, a bank will sell you 40 products. And we're saying we're selling you one product. Uh, and only to small businesses. What that lets us do is ask ourselves every day, how can we how can we provide the best credit card for small businesses? And and to that extent, what we've done is we've done you know unlimited employee cards for free, the ability to set spend limits on every employee card, and whether that's restricting, hey, this employee can spend 500, this other employee can spend 2,000, this employee can only spend at petrol stations, um, and that's all set by the account owners, and uh, you know giving them that really that flexibility there. We built the best rewards program for small businesses in the country, I believe, which is, uh, you know, when they earn, when they spend on their card, they earn one capital on tap point uh, for every pound they spend. They can redeem that for 1% cash back um, or uh, one obvious for every, for every capital on tap point. And then we've just built really useful features to make it easier and kind of hassle free to run your business. So accounting integrations with all the major accounting software. So when you spend on the card, those transactions show up in your accounting software automatically receipt capture so when you if you have an employee who goes and buys lunch on the company card and needs to expense it they can take a picture of that receipt and kind of make that a fully digital fully automated experience um and, and then we've also kind of tried to make this you know what's kind of i think a lot of the time when people think of fintech and, and, and especially in the payments and lending space they think of it as very millennial very london focused here in the uk and in reality our average customer is 49 years old and 80% and of them live outside of London. And so we've tried to build a product, not for, I guess, you know, the cohort I'm in, millennials. We've tried to build the best product for small businesses. And, and that's been our guiding light. And we think that's a, the differentiator that we have, um, you know, against our competition, which is primarily the banks. And then just in case, you know, I made, I made it sound easy, like we've had this strategy and that means it's, we've been successful. Um, since day one, it, it, this is what hard work looks like. So when we launched in August of 2012, um, you know, we thought we had it figured out. And it turns out this is what pro, you know, this is what success in a startup looks like. And this is growing 100% year over year since 2012. 
it just looks really minuscule when your base is really small. But I think, you know, if, and this is the advice I'd have for anyone kind of looking to get into the lending or the payments space as a, as a FinTech, you know, steady wins the race. You have to keep focused on your mission. You know, we want to help small businesses with working capital and then deliver the best possible experience for those small businesses. And, you know, now we, we're, 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 I think we're, we're just shy of 100,000 small businesses. We should eclipse that number in the next few months. And, and it's been amazing to kind of build this company from scratch and, and provide the best payment and lending product we can for small businesses. And, um, and yeah, it's, you know, we're taking our product globally. We look, we're hoping to launch in the U.S. and a couple other countries in 2021. And I'm excited to continue, you know, for Cap on Tap to continue this journey and providing the best product for small businesses. So thanks everyone for, for tuning into my part of the presentation. Um, I will turn it over now to Chris. Uh, I think we're doing a little panel discussion. Hey everyone. So in the next part of our panel, what we're going to do is we've got a few questions that we're going to run through and have a bit of a discussion with both Damien and, and Roku as well about some of the hot topics that are going on in the industry right now. So guys, thank you so much for your presentations and it's and it's great to see two small businesses such as your own growing and expanding at, at pace and really solving some of the consumer problems that we've seen and SME problems as well that are sort of clear in the market and having a direct um, answer for those. I've got a couple of questions here. So why do you think that credit fintech disruption is starting to happen now? Obviously, we'd seen disruption um, in other sectors and areas a little bit earlier on as well, even in the financial services space. But why do you think the time is now for credit to come, come to the fore there? Either of you got any thoughts on sort of the timing around the disruption that we're starting to see? Yeah, I, look, I... I come from from investment banking world, and uh, uh, it's, it's not up until the Greek crisis back in 2011-12, where uh, where all the QE and all the efforts from the central banks came out to to push liquidity out to the markets. And uh, what we've seen is uh, obviously public credit yields uh, go to very low levels. Uh, obviously, treasuries and, and govies going uh, negative, so that's pushing the level of water down. Also meant that you know, investors in debt credit or debt, public debt, also had to push out to invest in you know less explored or less um, popular ways of, of 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 lending. And one at the at the very same time, you had fintech marketplaces. Um, Sparking all over the place, which meant that these traditional lenders who would previously invest in public debt got crowded out of that market by the governments and pushed out to to private debt. And at the same time, businesses like us needing that capital, uh, we benefited a lot because we now can borrow from from traditional lenders uh, at, at significantly competitive rates. I'm not saying that. Uh, the super competitive, we could get better still, if you hear me out there. But uh, I think uh, it gave rise to, to flourish all of our businesses uh, that uh, like, took advantage of the situation. Uh, Roku, I think that's right. I think that the biggest challenge we've had, you know, since starting eight years ago, was um, getting the debt funding from the banks and the institutions. And, you know, as this becomes more commonplace, they become more comfortable with the asset. And as there's, as it's harder for investors to find yield elsewhere, they get more excited about different asset classes. And so the biggest challenge, especially in lending, is getting someone to give you the pile of money that you then give out. Um, so I think that's one aspect. I think the other aspect is, it's kind of growing as an ecosystem, right? So the more and more you have going on in payments, whether it's open banking and all the FinTechs in there and people trying to disrupt credit reference agencies and people, doing accounting and you know all these accounting integrations sitting on apis it's it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy that as more and more of this ecosystem gets built out more and more players emerge because it becomes easier to offer amazing products to your customers great fantastic it's great to hear from both of you there you've talked a little bit about both of your journeys as you you've sort of come along and obviously you're at different stages stages as well what advice would you give to any sort of 
new startups, if you like, in the in the lending space or early stage companies um, in this space, and, and what they, what key challenges they could expect to face. Amy, I mean, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, sure. So I, you know, I, I haven't gone through the zero to one phase in a while. Uh, but if you know when I'm in, you know when I'm talking to people who are thinking about entering the market, um, I always tell them to to go n narrow. You know, the, kind of the concept of a thousand true fans, right? So build a product that really fits to some cohort of consumers or small businesses or enterprises that they absolutely love and that you can make money on. And in you know that's not just in the lending business generally. And then you can grow the base from there. I think one of the mistakes we made is we didn't exactly know our target market and we said, oh, let's build a product for every small business from day one. When actually, if we had said, okay, what's the size? Maybe we would have started with one person, you know, sole traders or maybe partnerships and, and then expanded slowly. I think our our issue was we tried to go, go big because uh, it seemed exciting and fun and, and it really cost us to not just really focus our offering uh, initially. And I would have I would have gone with the best product for a small niche and then expanded to adjacent kind of verticals from there. Rovi, you're earlier in your journey. What, what advice would you give yourself 12 months ago? Your, your, your own uh, self. Yeah, I'm going to give a, a, a wider answer to, to that question. I, I think persistent persistence is underrated generally. It's a, it's a very valuable skills skill set uh, that is m even more relevant when you're uh, you know launching a new product a new venture and uh, in entrepreneurship it's probably your the, the most important skills that you need to have everything in my experience anyway when we started time it everything turned out to be slower and and smaller for longer than than we had planned otherwise so um i think for, for all entrepreneurs out there and and generally to, to the public, I think you have to be persistent uh, and, and to keep at it. It's, it's hard to, to build an innovative product. Yeah, I think um, maybe, and this is probably like a less popular opinion now where everyone's talking about work-life balance and, you know, getting, you know, and I was like, I'm kind of like, no, that does not exist. If you're starting a business, you should not also be trying to optimize for work-life balance. You know, that's a, that's something you optimize for when you built a business and have profits, uh, you know, uh, but I think if you're starting a business, you're a founder or co-founder, uh, you're going to, you're not going to win if you're working, you know, 40 hours a week. It's very hard. Yeah. Well, we, we're lucky because at least we're allowed to work from home these days. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and with those sort of changes, I suppose, um, there's been a lot of changes in how everyone's living their lives now across all, all walks of life. How have you seen sort of the changing consumer attitudes have you, before um, the pandemic as well, and even during, I suppose? What have you seen changing and what do you expect to change um, as well? And how, how can your businesses adapt adapt to that? Roka, do you want to go first on that one? Sure. So so we, yeah, we have seen, as, as, as well as the whole industry has uh, seen uh, a dramatic drop in spend. Obviously, no travel means that, yeah, a good portion of the, disposal income off uh, of, of customers that would otherwise go to to dinners, hotels, uh, flights and whatnot weren't, weren't being spent. So March and April we saw dramatic drop in, in spend amounts. Uh, and then the other thing that we saw with our uh, customer base is that people needed more flexibility along the lines of um, the mortgage payment holidays that the government uh, pushed out to the, for banks to do, we saw our customer base spreading purchases longer, for longer, just to, you know, keep cash for a rainy day. It was so uncertain everything in, in, back in March and April that I think it made sense to save the most amount in hand, cash in hand and then spread uh, any purchases you made for the longest term you you could afford and obviously we saw we saw our balances the, the life the duration of our balances uh on average uh spreading out towards the 24 month mark uh rather than the, the somewhere in the middle that we see today 
Um, I, I think on our end, you know, small businesses have been particularly affected by, you know, by being shut down. And I think customers are kind of now demanding more self-service tools and like, you know, kind of digitization of options. You know, and I think people got really fed up with eight hour wait times to ever, you know, get a mortgage holiday. And so I think, you know, there's going to be a huge push to automate a lot of that stuff uh, and, and really bring kind of self-service uh, to the forefront of the customer experience. Absolutely. And so I suppose to, to wrap up um, on some of the questions, could you talk to us a little bit about how you found the environment for launching a new product, particularly in the UK, um, given the regulatory environment and also the sort of consumer demand that we've talked about, all the expectations given the sort of maturity of, of the market. How did you find launching that sort of initial product? What helped you and what were some of the barriers that you, you faced as well? Yeah, I think for us, you know, we were one of the, the first people to be certified under the new FCA re regime in 2014. Um, and we found them really easy to work with. Um, we've, we've have both our lending license and an EMI, our electronic money license, and have found the FCA very reasonable um, and pretty simple to work with. Um, so I think, I think the, the advice I'd have is actually don't be scared just because it's a regulated industry. The rules are pretty well thought out the, and they're pretty um, prescriptive, which actually makes it, well, some are, some are, but um, I, I think it's, it's actually less scary than people think. And I think, um, and then it, it even um, places like Visa, I think the schemes have, um, have come a long way from, you know, six to eight years ago in working with kind of new starts, new, new starter companies compared to where they were. So I think it's an awesome time to be starting something in the payments and lending space. Yeah, and just to add to that, we had the chance, one of our founders is, uh, used to be based and work for, for the last 10 years uh, back in the US. And we did consider the the option to launch first in the US or set set, shop, set up shop in the US, or whether it would be a good idea to to, to move him to London and, and start up here. I think what you said, uh, Damon, is, is spot on. Uh, the FCA combined with Tax benefits uh, the HM, that HMRC provides, not yeah, you know, to name a few, R&D claims, EIS and SEIS, uh, alongside um, the fintech ecosystem that, that there is in Europe. I think it's it's it's, it's actually the best place um, from a regulatory perspective, uh, which which is the point of your question. Absolutely the best place, but all, all of the other things add up. And it's not just FCA, it's, it's HMRC, the government with the future fund, uh, you know, very quick to, to, to respond to, to the COVID crisis. These all those things that add up and we, we feel that we're really looked after here in, in London as a fintech. Absolutely. And I suppose some of those reasons are why we've seen London as sort of the leading light, if you like, in the fintech um, space for, for several years as well. So, so final question from me, and this is an open question for, for both of you as well, is what do you think the future holds for credit and for lending, whether that's for you, but also for the market more generally? I know, Damien, you mentioned about bundling versus unbundling and how we've seen sort of this explosion and fragmentation we, we've touched upon. Where do you see the, the market going over the next sort of three to five five years? Yeah, I think what's going to be really interesting is if there's going to be a replacement for the bank as the hub for lending and payments. Um, so right now, I think most people have their bank at their core, but, you know, in the consumer space, that could end up being kind of, you know, like a credit karma or something that's like a, you know, the, where your credit score is could be where you actually run your lending and your banking and your payment services. In the SME space, it could be your accounting provider, you know, that, that could be the core of what you do. So I think there's a potential for the kind of the core of where you run your finances from as a consumer or business to change. But then I also think there's an opportunity for the rebundling of these best in class services for small businesses or for consumers to kind of come together, I don't know in what form, what shape or form, but uh, I do think that unbundling almost always leads to rebundling. And so I think they're in, you know, call it five to seven years, there'll be someone who's done an amazing job in like eight verticals kind of coming together and replacing the bank is the best option for everything. 
I don't know. What do you think, Roger? Well, I was going to give you more of a view about the consumer end, uh, and and obviously, probably it usually touches me quite quite closely to the heart. I mean, I think financing in the world uh, in the world of consuming will 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 absolutely go to installments going forward. Um, I think we we obviously we wouldn't have started time it otherwise, but we think borrowing in installments used to be in the past a way to solving a, a, a pile of debt. Uh, you would you know, incur or look for installments to resolve an issue you have had with debt before. Whereas in the future with all these buy now, pay later options, time it and, and many other installment offerings there are in the market and there will be more obviously. Um, we tend to think that lending on the consumer space will will dramatically shift uh, to installment-based lending. I think, Chris, you had a slide in Brazil is 50% of the, of the lending, but equally it's very popular in Turkey, in Israel, all over Latin America, and uh, and 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 uh, Visa itself, it's it's very supportive of these installment um, sort of platforms and and uh, and ways of payment. So I think that that's apologies. This is my view from a consumer perspective. From a lending perspective, I guess I'm not responding to to your uh, to your question, Damien. But uh, but but this is how I see the future going forward in lending. Fantastic. Chris, what about you? I know you're the moderator, but what's the uh, what's your view of what, what's what's going to be happening in the future? What's Visa's point of view? I suppose um, more my own personal perspective, I suppose, rather than Visa's. But what we're seeing with installments and various other payment methods as well, and where consumers are shifting is moving a lot towards sort of the, the rent to own space in the subscription sort of economy is, is very interesting um, to us as well. We're doing a bunch of stuff in this space and really it's an area where we see ownership as a term changing in itself. And obviously that'll have a direct impact on, on lending as well. I think how we think about lending has traditionally been uh, fairly narrow in a way. We think about people needing um, money to buy something, but actually I think there's gonna be a much more of a blurring between ownership and how that then leads into whether that's installments or subscriptions or what i actually own we're starting to see this in i talked a little bit about motor finance earlier but we're going to see how that changes as well with um, players uh, doing sort of new leasing arrangements i don't need to own a car and i think this is going this is an area that's really going to explode out you no longer own records you don't own cds you have a spotify account you don't own movies you don't own dvds you sometimes don't even go to the films anymore you have a netflix account and really that then leads into how you borrow because effectively i don't i'm paying for a service rather than um rather than actually a good and i think, I, I, think that's a, between... I think that will lead into then where where that hub is where do all your subscriptions you know is your couch next to your spotify account right in your in that central finance hub of yours yeah absolutely so that's a it's a really interesting area and no doubt um we won't know we're just going to get these sorts of things um, spot on in their predictions, but it's certainly a, a really interesting area. And, and we see it with the Internet of Things already, sort of this explosion of sort of micro transactions. We, we definitely see that happening more and more in the future. So on that note, thank you both for your, your time. That was a fantastic session there in the panel. And we'll hand over for um, some questions and answers from the audience.